Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this final lecture of our seminar on the classical liberal tradition. Happy to be joined this evening by Brian Kogelman, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Maryland, where he serves as the director of the philosophy, politics, and economics major. He is also faculty affiliate at the Ed Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets and an affiliated fellow at the F.A. Hayek program at the Makeda Center at George Mason. He completed his PhD in four years at the University of Arizona, which has one of the top philosophy programs in the world, under the direction of Jerry Gauss, Dave Schmitz, and Steve Wall. He had, and now we're getting to the good stuff, five publications before finishing his PhD. His current total sits at around a dozen, and he's published in places like the Journal of Philosophy, American Political Science Review, and American Journal of Political Science. He also has a forthcoming book with Cambridge University Press. He has dreams one day of becoming a bullfighter. Brian knows how to publish, which is why we've asked him to deliver this talk entitled How to Publish in Grad School. Brian. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a lot of content uh, and very little time to give it. So I'm going to kind of skip with the intros, skip with the pleasantries and sort of just jump in right away. So this is a, this is a lecture on how to publish in grad school. But an initial question you might have is why should I publish in grad school. So the point of grad school is to attain a PhD and uh, publishing uh, articles and journals is not necessary to attain a PhD. So you don't need to publish to get a PhD. So why do it. Um, my argument is this. So when you start applying for jobs, so I'm talking about jobs as a professor at a university, you're going to be competing against hundreds of other candidates. So oftentimes for a single job opening, you could have upwards of 300, 400, 500 people apply. All of these persons are going to have PhDs uh, or are finishing their PhD currently. All of these persons will have written a dissertation uh, or are currently finishing their dissertation. And most of them will have glowing letters of recommendation, just like I'm sure you will. So a natural question is, if, I, if my application is going to be in a big pile that could be, you know, uh, consists of several hundred applications, how am I going to stand out? And I believe the best way of standing out, or at least one way of standing out, is to have several publications before you finish your PhD. So as of right now, most graduate students tend not to publish. This is changing more and more. Graduate students are starting to publish before they finish. But if you have three, four, five articles on your CV by the time you apply for jobs, that's a great way to stand out. So to start off, I want to talk about publishing in the coursework phase of your PhD, which is usually the first two or two and a half years of it where you're primarily taking courses. So I think the biggest myth that grad students tell themselves is that I only have to start worrying about publishing after I finish my coursework and start working on my dissertation, right? I, I, publishing is not something I need to focus on right now. That's a problem for year three, middle of year three, something like that. Um, I think this is incorrect. And I think that if you wait till your third or fourth year to start publishing, it's going to be a little too late. The reason why is that grad students often underestimate how long it takes to get something published. And this is even if your paper is really, really, really great. So many papers will be rejected two to three times before they're accepted. Um, that's certainly the case with me. I almost never get anything accepted on the first try. It takes me two, three, uh, sometimes four or five times at a journal, at different journals before it gets accepted somewhere. Uh, and beyond that, it can take half a year or more for a paper to receive review reports. Sometimes it can take half a year for a paper to get desk rejected. Um, my record, and I won't say the name of the journal, uh, from the day of submission until I received the initial reports was 14 months. And then I had to revise the paper, send it back, had it review again before it was accepted. It was a two year process. So the point is that publishing takes a very long time. And if you want to have some publications when you go on the market, it's a good idea to start right now. So more publishing in the coursework first. I think the key, I think the key thing to do when you're in coursework is to adopt the right perspective on what coursework is. So coursework is not an end in itself, at least in my view. A lot of people when they think about coursework, they say, look, it's an intrinsically valuable thing. It's just intrinsically good to learn more, to know more, to learn the roots and all the different components of my discipline or field. I think that's not quite the right way to think about it. 
the way I viewed coursework, I viewed coursework as just another hoop I had to jump through to get my PhD, right? It was another box I had to check, another box I had to tick off, and that's it. The reason why perspective is important is because it leads to this implication. And the implication is that you should spend the minimal effective time on coursework needed, spend the minimal time, amount of time needed to pass the course, then stop and allocate the remainder of your time to start working on your original research. So a lot of grad students say, look, I wanna do all the readings perfectly. I'm gonna read everything twice. I'm gonna do every recommended reading. I wanna have these brilliant, brilliant, brilliant comments ready for the seminar. If that's the way you think about it, that's a lot of time spent not working on your research. If you have a different view of what coursework is, it's just a hoop to jump through, then that's a lot more time for you to allocate to start working on your research earlier. Um, another thing to think about when you're in the coursework phase is turning term papers into articles. So many classes are gonna require you to write some kind of term paper, not all of them. Some of them might have exams, particularly in economics or political science or something like that. One thing you should try to do is you should use the, the, the term paper assignment as an opportunity to write something that can one day turn into a journal article. In my view, a term paper not written with the intent to one day be an article is sort of a waste of time. Now, I don't want to get your hopes up. Not everything you write, actually very little of what you write in the coursework phase is going to end up landing somewhere, but it's good to start getting in the habit of thinking, if I'm going to write something, I'm going to write something that has a chance of getting published one day. And that's how you should view your term papers is say, hey, I have to do this thing anyway. I'm going to make it work for me. One tip here is that um, your professors will often but not always be more permissive than you think when it comes to choosing a paper topic. So you say, look, professor, the course was on topic X. Uh, I really want to research on topic Y. They're connected in this minimal way. Do you think I could write on topic Y while using the resources and content for the course? Um, they might say no, and hey, that's life and it happens. But if they say yes, that's a really easy way to use the coursework to your advantage and allow you to start thinking about publishing articles that can, that can one day become publications. All right, the biggest, the biggest piece of advice though I have about the coursework phase in terms of publishing is do not take incompletes. So for those unfamiliar, an incomplete is when you don't fulfill all the requirements of the course and you sort of give the professor an IOU. Say, look, I couldn't get my paper in on time, uh, so I'll turn it in at a later date and the professor will then grade you on the paper at that later date. Um, the reason why incompletes are sort of the bane of a graduate student's existence is that summers and winters are the perfect time for you to be researching, right? So semesters are, are hectic, right? You have courses, you're teaching your own courses, there's seminars, there's colloquia, there's brown bags. Most conferences are during the semester, hard to get some stuff done, but the summer, man, that is three months for you to just hunker down, think about your research, start being productive. The issue is if you took some incompletes and you're finishing a term paper from a course two years ago, that's time over your precious summer that you're not, you're not spending doing research. So really the biggest thing is, you know, when you're taking those courses, get the work done and move on, right? There's no reason to, to have lingering incompletes. That's not gonna help you get publications. All right, so enough about the coursework phase. I wanna talk more generally now about how to write productively. So in my view, and you know, this is something that reasonable people disagree about, so a lot of this, talk is me telling you what worked for me and others who I kind of know and I'm friends with. In my view, the most important factor that goes into being writing is being consistent. Consistency, consistency, consistency. What I mean by this is that you must write consistently, which means at a minimum, do it every weekday. Um, some people might want to go more than every weekday. So when I was in grad school, I worked six days a week. I'm not saying you have to do that. Uh, if, if five days a week is, is what you prefer, that's fine but treat writing as a job, a normal job, do it at least five days a week, do it consistently. A lot of people, a lot of young scholars, I think have this impression, they say, well, if I'm gonna be a productive writer and pr produce productive research, I just need one awesome writing session, just like one marathon session where I get it all out one or two times a week to pump out the papers that I need to do. I think that's a deeply mistaken view. I'm always going to take five or six mediocre average writing sessions over one amazing writing session ever, ever at any day of the week. And the reason sort of to, to, to highlight why I'm going to give you a metaphor that I like to use 
about two runners and whether it's, it's more productive to be a consistent runner who doesn't run very well or an inconsistent runner who gives heroic efforts. So suppose we have two people, A and B, and A and B both want to be runners and they both want to get in good shape. Person A is very consistent with her running. She goes running five or six days a week. She doesn't always want to do it. She doesn't always want to be there. Like me, she's grumpy a lot of the times and sometimes she kind of gives a half-ass effort, but she, she's always there on the road five or six days a week. Compare this to person B. Person B only goes running one or two days a week, but person B, every time she goes out, she, she does an all out effort, right? She's going, you know, as, as hard as she can. She's eating the little gel packs that the runners eat and all that. If you ask yourself, well, who's going to be a better runner two or three or four years down the road? My gut tells me that it's going to be the consistent runner who always gives an average effort versus the inconsistent runner who gives heroic efforts. I think the same thing applies to you as, as researchers and scholars. I think you're gonna get a lot farther if you're just very consistent, even if you're just giving an average effort every day versus being inconsistent and in, in sort of giving a better effort. All right, let's talk about metrics and how we should measure whether we're being consistent or not. So you need to write consistently every weekday, but what does this actually mean in practice? So there's two popular metrics that, um, that, that scholars, scholars like to use. So one, uh, so th these two metrics are the time versus the word count. So the time metric people, they say, look, uh, I'm gonna write five days a week and I'm gonna do it for a certain set amount of time. So I'm gonna write for two hours every day, five days a week. The word count people on the other hand, they say, well, I'm not gonna do the time thing. I'm gonna try to hit a certain word count goal every day. So every day I'm gonna hit 500 words. Every day I'm gonna hit a thousand words and I'm gonna do that five or six days a week. So which should you use? Which metric is the best, which was metric is the best one? Um, you're gonna need to try them out for yourself. There's no general answer to that. I know very successful time people. I know very successful word count people. Uh, there, there's no answer. In an ideal world though, you're gonna use both. So this is what I do. Um, in the summer, when I have more time to do my research, because I didn't take the incompletes, right? So I, I have more time to do my research in the summer. I do word counts in the morning and then I do time in the afternoon. So I do two writing sessions a day. In the morning, I say, look, all I want to do is get a thousand words on the page. They don't have to be very good. They don't have to be coherent. They don't, hey, they don't even have to be spelled right. I just want a thousand words on the page in the morning. So that's my word count goal. And then the afternoon, I set a time goal. So I say, now that I have those a thousand words, I'm going to spend two hours or an hour and a half or something like that. And I'm going to kind of sculpt what I did in the morning, right? So the way I think about it is the morning is just kind of like a machine gun spraying out. Just get it out, get it out, get it done. And then in the afternoon, we're kind of sculptors and we're trying to make those words into a coherent, uh, coherent argument so that has, you know, pleasing prose and all that. So two metrics that I think will work for a lot of people, uh, time and word count, and, and likely both are gonna have a place in your, in your research, so you should try out both. Um, another key to being consistent is prioritizing your writing. So if you're gonna write consistently, it needs to be a priority in your life. One habit of very successful people, and again, this is not all people, this is really descriptive of me, my practices, and several people I know. One habit of very successful people is they like to write first thing in the morning. Why is that a good idea? Why is that important? Um, a very wise person once told me that someone will find a way to ruin your day by 11 a.m. So obviously this is hyperbolic, but the idea is that academics, our lives can be hectic. By 11 a.m., you can get an email from a student saying, hey, I really need to study the material. Can you come in for a special office hours? And of course you should say yes, because being a good teacher is very important. You can get an email saying, hey, uh, so-and-so professor is at, in from out of town. They wanna give a last minute brown bag, you should come. Get an email by 11 a.m. from someone in the Dean's office saying, hey, we looked at your proposal for your grant. We want to come in and talk to you about it. So a lot of things, a lot of unexpected things can come up and that can get away in the way, in the way of writing, but not if you prioritize it and do it first thing in the morning, right? So the idea is to get the most important things out of the way first. The rest of the day can be spent on coursework, teaching, prep, answering emails, that kind of stuff. For those of you who say you're not a morning person, um, that may very well be true. And this piece of advice not, might not be the piece of advice for you. I will say that there was a time in my life um, when I used to sleep until noon or one o'clock in the afternoon. And when I was in graduate school, I received this piece of advice from one of my mentors. 
And I started waking up uh, absurdly early, 4.30. I wouldn't recommend you do that. That's too early. Um, I started waking up a lot earlier. And after three or four weeks, it turns out that I was a morning person. And this was a really important uh, factor in my productivity. So, you know, if you're not a morning person, that's, that, that, that's life, I understand. But it might be worth trying this for, th for three or four weeks and see if, it, see if it works for you. All right, more tips for consistency, which, again, is the most important thing. Um, I always like to have multiple projects going at the same time. So working on two or three papers at the same time. Why is this important? Well, inevitably, you're going to get stuck on a project and not know what to say. So uh, the best scholars in the world, they all get writer's block. They all get stuck. It's nothing to be ashamed of at all. It happens to all of us. But what you don't want to do is get stuck on a project and then stop being productive. When it happens, when you do get that writer's block, don't languish, just jump to another project, right? So I'm on project A, I don't know how to go any further with it, I'm stuck. Okay, that's life, I'll go on to project B and I'll start working on project B. Being consistent doesn't always mean working on the same project, it just means having some kind of constant forward motion. I think that's the key I'm trying to get across here. Just, you know, five days a week, maybe six days a week, you need to be trying to move the needle forward each time. That's the key to being a successful, productive scholar. Um, I don't know what to say. So a lot of people, they really want to be consistent, but they might get writer's block, and they might also not have another project to jump to. So what do I do then? Is that an excuse to sort of not be productive? Um, this is a tough situation when this happens, and this is a tough business. Um, here's what I do when this happens, and it, maybe it'll work for you. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll read a paper that I want to write about. So we'll say that Dr. X, she has this really wonderful paper in a big journal. I think I disagree with it, but I'm not sure why. I don't really know what to say. So what I do is I start out by writing down in the most excruciating detail, the most charitable detail I can, Dr. O Dr. X's central argument for her claim. So I try to reproduce her argument as best I can. And I found that for myself over the course of, of doing this, I tend to figure out what I think is wrong with the argument. So I, when, you know, when I try to be charitable and clear, articulating someone else's view, I almost always find what I think is the weak point in the argument. And when you find the weak point in the argument, you have yourself a paper, right? That's what a, pa a lot of papers just are. Here's what Dr. X said. Here's why Dr. X is wrong, right? Um, so here's sort of a corollary to the previous slide. Uh, the previous tip is part of a more general phenomenon, which is writing is thinking and thinking is writing. Um, I think a lot of graduate schools, uh, graduate students, when they approach the writing process, they say to themselves, okay, before I start writing, before I start writing, I need to know what my thesis is in the clearest words possible, and I need to know every single step of the argument. Um, I don't think that's true. At least it's not true for me. Um, I almost always don't know what my argument is when I start a paper. I find that out along the way. And I think that's perfectly fine and it's perfectly normal. The way I think about it is that writing is a discovery process, right? Writing is not the, the end of a discovery process. Writing is the discovery process itself. Perfectly fine to start a project not knowing where it's going. I think most people do that. And if you consistently chip away at it, that those five days a week, you consistently do that, I think you're gonna find your thesis along the way. Um, another thing, I need to read more before I write. So one mistake graduate students make is they think they need to master literature before they contribute to it. So I wanna work in field X, and before I work in field X, I gotta know everything about it. I think that's a mistake, and I think it's a mistake for a lot of reasons. So one reason is that you're gonna find out what you really need to read over the course of the writing process. So if you wanna make a contribution to a certain field, it's probably not the case that you need to read everything in that field. It's probably the case that you only need to read 20 to 30% of it. You're not gonna know what that 20 to 30% is until you actually start the writing process, right? So, so you know, just finding out what's pertinent in the first place, we can make that a lot easier if we start writing and start trying to figure out what we're trying to say. Another reason is that if you read before you write, which I'm telling you not to do, if you read before you write, you'll likely convince yourself that your ideas are unoriginal. So you say, look, I wanna write on this topic, and I think I, I kinda know what I wanna say, but I don't really know. So I go read everything there is on it, and oh, Dr. X, he said it first. So because Dr. X said it first, now I can't say it. 
Um, if you write before you do the reading, I think you're going to realize that mo more often than not, your ideas actually are original and you'll better be able to situate them within the existing literature. So if you start writing before you do the reading, you encounter Dr. X's paper, say, oh, Dr. X is saying something kind of similar to me, but actually there's this tiny little difference between what I want to say and what Dr. X is saying. And that's part of the paper now, right? That's situating your, your argument within the existing literature. And that's a good paper. Good paper says, you know, Dr. X, he argues for this position. And I think he's, he's kind of right, but not really. And I'm going to argue for something very similar, right? So again, I think that I think it's better to do to, to, to do the writing before you start reading, because I don't want you to trick yourself into saying, well, they said it first. I think what you're going to say is different than what other people are saying, but you're going to be able to better differentiate that after you started getting some words on the page. All right, how to publish. So you've written the paper, you were consistent, which is great, and now you want to publish it. So what do you need to know? Um, well, here's the bad news. The bad news is that publishing is incredibly hard. Um, you will get very many rejections. Um, the reviewers will say very mean things. I don't know why they do it, but when you give people anonymity, um, some, some of their, you know, worse angels come out, come out. And these mean things will hurt your feelings a lot. And that's, that's still true of me today. I still get rejected a ton. Um, and, it, and the criticism and the feedback is sometimes still very hurtful to me. Just to kind of give you a reference and so you don't get discouraged when you inevitably start getting the rejections, um, I started, try, I took my own advice because it's not really my advice. My mentors in graduate school gave me much of this advice. So I started trying to publish my first year. Uh, I got over 20 rejections before my first publication. And the first publication ended up in the number one journal in my field. I'm not, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to sort of say, hey, look, don't, don't get down with the rejections. They happen. They happen to everyone. You just got to keep being consistent, keep working at it, and the good things are going to happen. Um, like I said, I still get rejected more than I get accepted. Review reports still hurt, but that's life, and you just kind of kind of keep chipping away every day. All right, a little more detail here. So in general, there are two desiderata you're going you're to want to satisfy when you're publishing. All things equal, all things equal, more publications are going to be better than less publications. Also, all things equal, you want to publish in top journals. So here's the two things you want, right? You want a lot of publications and you want them in very good places. These two desiderata conflict with one another. So that's not good, right? Top journals obviously are going to have higher rejection rates. That's what makes them top journals. What is more concerning, and this isn't always true, this is something that I've just noticed myself, top journals can often take longer to reject you. So I've noticed that when I send my stuff to tier one places and they reject it, those take a lot longer to get back to me than when I send them to lower ranked places. So this suggests that the pursuit of quantity means a trade-off with quality and vice versa, right? So that's a problem. If you, if you go for too much quality, you might have low quantity. Too much quantity, you might have low quality. So what do you do? So in an ideal world, you should be productive enough to diversify. So I'm going to tell you about the Munger rule. So Mike Munger, who does IHS events time to time like this, uh, is a professor of, of political science at Duke. He has what he calls the Munger rule. And the Munger rule says that by the time your ABD, all but dissertation, you should have three papers under review at all times. So the Munger rule is a minimum standard. You want three things under review at all times. I'm going to propose what I call the Kogelman extension. And the Kogelman extension says, one of these papers should be under review at a top journal and the other two in tier two outlets, right? So that's just diversifying where you're sending your work. Always have something, if you're, if you're productive enough for three articles at one time, you know, you shoot for the stars with one of them and then be a little more conservative with two more. So what if you don't meet the Munger rule? Not everyone can have three papers under review at all times. That's, that, that happens, that's life. Um, in these cases, my judgment is that it's best to be safe and aim for the tier twos. So shooting for the stars is great, but what you want to avoid most is going on the market with an empty CV. So going on the market with an empty CV, to me, that's sort of the worst case possible. I'd rather have, you know, a couple tier two publications, even one tier two publication than nothing. So if you're not productive enough to diversify, that's fine. But in my personal opinion, you might be better off being a bit more conservative with where you send stuff. Um, from dissertation to publications. So nowadays, um, many departments will let you do a three paper option for a dissertation rather than a manuscript. So in the olden days, 
when you wrote a dissertation, uh, usually was uh, uh, resembled a book manuscript. Nowadays, a lot of places will say, hey, you don't have to do that. You can just write three standalone papers and that's sufficient to get your PhD. If this is an option for you, I highly, highly, highly recommend you take it. And this is coming from someone who didn't take it. So this is a mistake that I made. I wrote a book manuscript and that probably wasn't the best thing for me. The reason why is that if your dissertation consists of standalone papers, really easy to submit them, right? If your dissertation is just three really good papers, then it's really easy to send three really good pieces of writing out to review. If your dissertation consists of a book manuscript though, it takes considerable effort to generate standalone papers for it. So it is a lot of work to take a book manuscript style dissertation and then chop them up into papers and then send the papers off. Um, now, a lot of you might be saying, well, look, I wanna write the next great you know, book of philosophy, the next great book in political science or political theory. Those are great goals to have and I fully support them. This piece of advice, what I'm trying to say is that maybe if, if your goal is to be the kind of scholar who writes books, you might wanna push that off just a few years into the future, focus on the individual papers, focus on getting the articles now, and then once you've got that, that great tenure track job, then you can start working on the book project. I think that's the, the more reasonable way to look at it. Um, in an ideal world, your dissertation will consist of three papers that have already been published. Uh, I've known some people who have done that. It's very impressive. It's a great goal to aspire to. If you don't reach it, nothing to, nothing to be ashamed of. Because like I said, publishing is a hard thing to do, but um, it certainly can be done. All right, so this is my last slide. So what's the biggest piece of advice I have? Um, the biggest piece of advice I have is to think about what graduate school is and what graduate school is for. So the purpose of graduate school is to train you to become a professor. The idea is to, it's to get the training. When you get a PhD, you're trained to become oftentimes, not always, oftentimes to be a professor at a university, at a, in a university setting. That means that you should start doing in graduate school right now, the things that professors do. Professors, the two main things we do, we publish research and we teach. So right now you should allocate your time to these sorts of activities. Spend enough time on teaching to be a, com a competent instructor, right? Teaching is a noble profession. We should never cut corners in our teaching. We should always put the work in to give compelling lectures, to, to, to educate our students and to be there when they have questions for us. So be a competent instructor and with the rest of the time you have left over, invest that into producing original research, right? Invest that in producing original research, be consistent with it, constantly chip at it, chip away at it every day. And I think, I think you'll see some, some good things happen. All right, that was really fast. I apologize for how fast it was, but um, I'm happy to try my best to answer any questions you might have. Um, I, I might not be able to answer all of them, but I will certainly do my very best. Thank you. All right, Brian, thank you. So we have a bunch of questions and, uh, and, and they're good ones. So first off, do you sketch out an argument before you start writing, maybe with an outline or something like that? No, no, um, I'm, never, I'm never that fully, I've never that fully thought about what I'm gonna say when I start. Like I said, most of my papers start with, um, you know, Dr. X said something, it's interesting, but I don't, I, I say, my, my first intuition always, that can't be right. That can't be right what he said. Um, and again, I just start to say, okay, what are they really saying? What's really the argument? I start going through, and then as I go, I say, oh, well, that premise doesn't make any sense. That premise can't be right. So there's where the problem is. And then from there, the paper naturally evolves. People do do outlines and they do very successfully at it. So a, a lot of what goes on in being productive methods, but what I don't want is for you to use, to say, I need an outline before I start and that being an excuse not to start. That's a problem. So if, you're, if, if, you, if that sounds like it might describe you, I don't know if it does, but if that sounds like it might describe you, one thing to say is, okay, it might be a little scary, but I'm gonna to try to jump in a little bit faster. Should we worry about premature publishing? Um, well, what would the exact worry be? So I've heard a few arguments about why you should not publish prematurely. So one argument is they say, look, if you don't publish in the very, very best places early on, you're gonna sort of reveal that you're not a top quality scholar. 
Um, and that might be true, right? So if, if in graduate school, all you have are articles at the tier two level, tier three level, you might reveal that you're not going to be the next Nobel Prize winner. That might be true. But I always think of it in, in comparative terms. So what's the alternative? If I don't if I don't get those tier two, tier three articles, I can maybe hit it out of the park and get a top article. That would be great. Or I have nothing. And I've been watching the job market long enough and close enough to know that having nothing is for, for a lot of people, having nothing is not a very good idea. It's better to have something than nothing. And if that means you don't get in the very best places, um, so be it. So that's the only reason I can think of to worry about publishing too early is, hey, I might not have the best hits, but I think the risk of having nothing is, is just simply too great to, to let that be the overarching consideration. Can you speak to research and collaboration among grad students and uh, like uh, among grad student peers and or grad students with their professors? Yeah, so one concern with grad students and professors is that there's going to be a tendency for people who see that to, to say, well, it was really the professor who did everything and they took the graduate student along for a ride to give them a publication. Um, I published one, I, in grad school, I published, I didn't, this wasn't one of my articles, I published a book chapter with my advisor and um, certainly people could have thought about that. So one thing your advisor can do is when they write the letter of recommendation for you, they can say, hey, student X, um, even though she published a, a paper with me, you might think that I did all the work, but actually X is the one who did Here's how X contributed to the to the paper, generally speaking. Um, so that's one way of allaying that concern. But it is still a concern that if you publish a lot with your advisor, people are going to think your advisor did more than you, whether that's right or wrong. Not saying you know that could be a false impression. People tend to think that. In terms of collaborating with other graduates, I think it's a great idea. And the reason why is because you're still forming as scholars. You still don't know everything you need to know. So it's like you guys are gonna have different parts of the puzzle and you can put them together, uh, put, that, put the puzzle together with one another. What I really like to see, especially among philosophers and political theorists, is collaboration with scholars across disciplines. And the best way to do that is to meet other graduate students at IHS events or Mercatus Center events or something like that. So um, some reasons to be wary when you do it with a faculty member, but I see no reason to avoid publishing with other graduate students. I think it's a wonderful thing. How do you go about getting a sense of which parts of the literature are really essential to master for the paper and which you can just sort of set to the side? Um, broad reviews of survey articles are always good or encyclopedia entries. Finding the paper that's closest to the thesis that you're gonna argue for within that survey and then just following the footnotes from there. But again, but again, so, you know, you might want to write a paper about legitimacy, uh, a philosophy paper about the idea of legitimacy. One approach you say, well, I'm going to read um, the SCP article, the Stanford Encyclopedia article on legitimacy. I'm going to read all the major books that are cited. I don't think that's the right way to go. I think, look, what do I really want to say about legitimacy? It'll probably be a very minor thing you want to say. I want to talk about legitimacy and uh, the epistemological components of it. So you start kind of writing what you're thinking. And then you say, okay, let me go read the, the Stanford Encyclopedia review on the idea of legitimacy. And oh, the, the, the papers that are relevant to what I want to say, there's only like four or five of them. So then I'll go read those. Right. So I, I just, I, I think there's always better ways to, you know, you start the writing first, you go consult a broad survey article, SEP, um, Annual Political Science Review, Journal of Economic Literature, and then you find the very narrow papers that are relevant to what you want to say. What advice would you give to a PhD student who tends to be too long-winded in papers and or has too many ideas for paper topics and struggles to decide which ones to pursue? Um, too many ideas is great. So you should have a Word doc uh, that, you know, I have, I have a Word doc that's ideas for future papers. It's absurdly long and it, I haven't, you know, I haven't deleted anything off it since graduate. That's a great problem to have, you know, because that's your, your, what, that, that's your issue. In terms of how to select for that set, from that set of, of all these ideas, certainly what you're interested in matters, right? You should never, you know, if, if, if your heart is on topic X, you should write on topic X because it's probably going to be better because you love it. 
Now, if there's a lot of things that you love and there's room to choose between them, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to look at what's been published on lately. So there tends to be trends in literature. Certain topics get real hot. Certain topics get cold and no one's written about them in 10 years. If you have some latitude there, um, go, go with what's hot. And then in terms of too long winded, I had that same problem. I got yelled at all the time from my advisor about this. One big thing, I this is going to sound incredibly silly, but one thing I did is I don't let myself use footnotes when I write papers because footnotes are really just an opportunity for you to be obnoxious if you kind of think about it. So footnotes is where all the long windedness comes out and you brag about how much you know. So I said, look, I'm not going to do any footnotes. All my citations are going to be intact citations and I'm only going to use a footnote if I absolutely need it. And the goal is for a zero footnote paper with intact sites. That helps a lot. And the other thing too is that when you start submitting, when you start seriously getting ready to submit papers to journals, that's going to discipline you a lot because they all have word limits. Right, so a generous journal will be 12,000, almost none are 12,000, a lot are 10, even more are eight. So, you know, that's gonna discipline you once you start getting ready to submit. What I, one thing I will say is that if for first drafts, it's fine to be long-winded. Totally fine to have a 14,000 word draft, because again, when you're writing the draft, you're figuring out what you need to say. So don't try to limit yourself there, but once you have the first draft, put it aside, Go work on another project for a couple of weeks. Come back when you read it with fresh eyes. You say, "Okay, I got to I got to chop six thousand words because I want to submit it to Journal X." And you know, you got to make the tough decisions then. How much do reviewer comments matter? How often should you just ignore them or not let them get to you? How how do you tell the difference? Well, I think there are really two questions there. Um, one is how to not let them get to you. And I interpret that as how do I not let it get me down? Like I said, you know, they can be hurtful. I think the thing to keep in mind is that this is a tough, tough discipline. It's a tough, tough field of work. Everyone's under pressure. And a lot of people use the anonymity of peer review to sort of act in a way they wouldn't normally act. I think one thing that's helpful is to destigmatize it by listening to older scholars tell their stories. So, you know, I had a Facebook thread with some buddies like a year ago, and we were all, we all listed our meanest reviewer comments. And one comment I got in graduate school was, um, this paper would be an insult to raw scholarship if it could be called scholarship. Oof, that's a bad one, right? Um, another one, I had a journal like tell me, my, they said my paper was so bad, they said, well, maybe you just shouldn't submit to this journal anymore. Maybe this journal isn't for you. So, you know, you're, if you're getting if you if you're if you're getting hurt from the things that we said, you're not alone. <laughs> We're all in that together. Now, the other way of interpreting the question was, you know, when a reviewer critiques my work and they reject it, to what extent should I um, should I revise the paper in light of the comments before I send it out again? I can't give you a good answer because that's more of an art than a science. And it's just something you figure out along the way. Now you, you certainly have to take them all seriously because our first goal, first and foremost is honest scholarship. And if there's a problem with your work, you are obligated to fix it. Um, you also need to keep in mind that there's a good chance you're going to get the same reviewer again the next time. So you might as well try to appease them. Um, but there have been cases where I've, I've thought of an, a, a reviewer was so out of bounds. I said, I'm not gonna, not gonna bother revising in light of that. But I would say that's less than 10% of the time. Most, and it doesn't mean you rewrite the paper, but I say 90% of the time when I get rejected with comments, the paper is gonna change in some way because of those comments. So instead of a rejection, you get an R&R. &R. How should you think about responding to those reviewers? You should do everything they say 99% of the time you should do everything they say without fighting it and you should be as gracious as humanly possible when you write the response letter. Um, you know, publications matter so much for advancement in the field that when you're at a young age, I wouldn't be choosing hills to die on to fight with reviewers. I would say, look, I disagree with the reviewer. I, I, you know, but I think they're wrong, but I really need the publication. So I'm going to make the edits they recommend. Um, it's not uncommon to think that 
a lot of people think that the first versions of their papers are better than the published versions for this reason. But a lot of people realize that, hey, you know, I got to do what I got to do to make it. To give you some, to give you some consolation, you know, you might say, well, I don't like that. I'm kind of kowtowing to people I disagree with. I, I certainly understand that emotion. But once you establish yourself and once you have that tenure track job and once you get a book contract, you can be more independent. You can voice, you can, you know, voice your concerns more. Once you don't, once you don't absolutely need publications to get tenure or a job, then you can start pushing back a little bit more. But this is a lecture about how to publish in grad school. So the presumption is you don't have a stable job yet. And to get that job, we want to see the publications. And sometimes that means just kind of biting your tongue and just say, okay, reviewer two is wrong, but I can do the edits anyway. Can you point out some common issues that journals look at, especially whenever they get a submission? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So I take it to be like, what are, what are some of the most common things that could sync a, a paper submission? Uh, what are things that editors are especially looking for in a submission? Um, that's really hard to say because editors are so idiosyncratic. Um, I've had papers, so I have a paper in the American Political Science Review, which is number one political science journal. That paper got desk rejected at other places before it got published there. So to, to say that, well, here's the things that editors like, um, that's really hard to really hard to say. One of the things that you learn, this is sort of like what Hayek talks about with tacit knowledge. One of the things you learn once you're in the game and you're submitting enough and you're reading enough, you, you sort of figure out what editors like what kind of stuff and what editors like don't kind of stuff, don't like what kind of stuff. It's incredibly hard to articulate that knowledge in terms of like, well, what is the editor of journal X one? I was like, well, I, I don't know, but I'll know when I see it kind of thing. Um, one thing is that papers can sometimes read too much like a graduate student. So a paper that does that says, look, person X says this and person X is wrong. You always, when you write, you know, a lot of papers are strictly critical papers. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you're showing that someone's wrong, you want to show that it's interesting that they're wrong. You want to show that they're wrong in an interesting way because their being wrong shows us the right way forward or something like that. They're, because they're wrong, we're going to learn more about this concept that we didn't know before. So I think one thing they'll look out for is if a paper just says, person X says this, person X is wrong. Uh, the, they're going to look for a little bit deeper of analysis, but that's something that you learn to do if you just work at it consistently, right? If you just, if you spend your five days a week writing and you're kind of reading articles in the afternoon from journals, just say, okay, you'll, you'll kind of figure out what a paper is and what a paper feels like. Once you get to the second tier journals, how do you decide uh, amongst those journals where to submit? Um, yeah, so even within, even within like the tier two journals, there's gonna be hierarchies there. So all things equal, higher up in the tier two is better than lower. Um, another, kind of related to the last comment, certain journals tend to publish more of certain things and less of certain things. I guess, so here's one tip that I, th I should have mentioned that I didn't. One thing that you should do is you should sign up for email updates for table of content updates for every single relevant journal in your field. And it's obnoxious because now you're going to get emails every day saying there's a new paper in the philosophical quarterly. And most of the time you won't care about it, but you need to pay attention to what kind of journals are publishing, what kind of work and say, okay, this journal, they kind of likes this. They kind of like the stuff I write on. This journal is very good, but they haven't published my kind of stuff in the last 10 years. And, it would be really improbable if I was the first person they published on that subject. So I think looking at fit is good. Um, yeah, just looking at, you know, who's published what there in the last five or six years to say, am I fitting within the theme? Am I not fitting within the theme? How valuable do you rate commentaries and letters in place of articles or alongside articles? Um, it's a tricky question because it, it depends on how long the commentaries and the letters are. Um, at some journals in some places, a commentary is like 500 words. That really can't count as an article. Um, I have a commentary in the journal Philosophy. That was, I think, 6,000 words. So that's substantive enough to be, to, be, to count as sort of a paper or, you know, at least three quarters of a paper, something like that. So yeah, like if, if, 
if you can do commentaries that are like over five or 6,000 words, I think those will be considered, they'll be looked, looked upon like journal articles. But if it's places where they're like 1,000 words, 500 words, that's probably not going to cut it. Um, and that's a good thing to look out for. So a lot of top places will allow people to reply. All things equal, replies are easier to get accepted at a top place in a standalone article. So if you can write a 5,000 word reply to a piece published at the number one journal, um, that could be a really great opportunity for you. How, if at all, does our, or should our thinking about publishing change in a post-COVID world? And the parenthetical remark here says, standards increased or decreased? Oof, well, one thing that's gonna happen is that the market's gonna get a lot more competitive. So um, I'm not a doomsdayer about COVID. COVID has interrupted a lot, but I think life will be normal within two or three years. But one thing that's happening is that no one's gonna hire anyone for the next year. Um, that's very unlikely. A lot of places that were hiring this year canceled their searches in the middle of them. Um, <clears throat> that happened in my de department, which was really tragic. So there's gonna be a lot of people who are staying in grad school longer than they otherwise would. Um, there's gonna be a bigger bunching, right? So when the market finally opens up again, there's gonna be more people, uh, more people in it. So there's gonna be a, a supply shock or something of, of, of labor. Um, so I think publications will matter more because there's even more reason to differentiate yourself. In terms of what's pu pu publishing like in the post COVID world, it's fascinating because I think there's a lot of young scholars like myself who don't have very much to do. So we're writing a lot, we're being very productive. On the other hand, I think there's a lot of scholars who um, have, have children or have other obligations that they now have to pay more attention to and they're not as productive. One of, the, one of the things I've also noticed is that the review times are even longer now in the co post COVID world than before. And I think that's because again, people have all these that maybe they're taking care of a sick relative or something. The, the, the reviewer pool is shrinking. And at the same time, the, people, the pool of people submitting is growing. So it's taking even longer, at least in my, it's taking even longer to get reviewer reports back. And I think that speaks to all the more reasons that you need to start right now. If this is something you want to do, if this is something you want to succeed in, it's going to be more competitive. It's taking even longer. Start sooner rather than later. We have time for one last question. What beyond publishing should grad students be thinking about to position themselves well on the market? Um, well, in life in general, you know, think about the good, find out what it is, adhere to it. Uh, that's always important. Also important is the right. But in terms of other stuff, um, networking matters, going to conference matters. I think people overestimate how much networking matters. I don't, I didn't go to a lot of conferences and I, it turned out okay, but certainly that's going to matter a lot too. But my, my, my concern with these types of questions is that other things matter besides publishing, but I'm worried that the second I say what it is like networking, people are going to overemphasize how much it matters and that's going to detract from the amount of time we spend on research, right? So, you know, I say publishing is up here. I say networking is also important. When I say that, I don't mean networking is here. I mean networking is here, right? Still matters, but again, if you have limited time to allocate, it's, it should be in the publishing. And the reason why that matters is, you, you know, grad students, you can go to too many conferences. Conferences take up time, right? You want to give a nice presentation. You don't want to embarrass yourself. Uh, conferences are exhausting. Once you get back from one, you don't really feel like working for four or five days. You're kind of tired and all that. You're jet lagged and all that stuff. So... <clears throat> Those things matter, um, but don't, I would not overemphasize how much they matter. I think the big thing is, you know, you want to have those three or four articles on your CV when you go on the market. And then, you know, after that, network a little, sure, do a little service, sure. But, um, you know, if you have zero publications, there's a chance that your application is just going to be thrown out. And that's the last thing we want to happen. That's all the time we have. Professor Kogelman, thank you. All right, so I have just a few closing remarks for us and then uh, we will be done with this year's seminar. So first, let me just say uh, thank you for joining us and for your flexibility in this experiment of ours in an online seminar. This has been brand new for us and uh, it's been a great experience. We, we feel like it's been a success. and We hope that you do as well. 
I also want to let you know that we are having another seminar in July that will deal with some of the modern challenges to the liberal tradition. And we would welcome you to sign up for that. Uh, we will drop a link to the registration form into the chat. You can find that on our website. You will be getting a link by email with a survey. And we would love for you to tell us um, about how you enjoyed this seminar, what we can improve for next time, and what your experience was like. We really care about your feedback. We read all of these. Uh, I, I end up reading them multiple times. And uh, what you say will have a direct impact, not just on our seminar in July, but all future summer seminars going forward. So please just take a, a few moments and give us your honest feedback. We would really appreciate that. And then last, I just want to let you know about a few of the other offerings that IHS has, ways that IHS can help you in your grad career. So we will also drop a link into the chat that uh, will just want to focus on three very briefly. The first is funding. So uh, we have a program called the Hayek Fund that can help you go to conferences to present your research if you are in a discipline that requires you to travel to a, an archive or if you need to buy an expensive data set or something like that. Um, apply through the Hayek Fund to get support for that work. Um, we also have the Humane Studies Fellowship, which is a, a prestigious award that can help you with your, uh, you know, uh, all, of, all of the expenses that come with uh, being a grad student. So funding is the first thing. Secondly, we do seminars just like this, but also discussion colloquia where we will uh, bring you in whenever we can bring people in again uh, to have a discussion about uh, classic texts and important works within the liberal tradition. We also have research workshops. Uh, we have a, a graduate conference coming up uh, very soon in July. And if you have not yet signed up for that conference or uh, what we're calling GradCon 2020, you should sign up for that uh, to present your research, get feedback from faculty who will be in the audience and who will give you feedback as well as uh, the chance to get to talk with all of your peers and uh, several more uh, great seminars like that. When you are on the job market, we have a, a great program that we are developing for those who are on the market for getting you success, all of those things. Um, and then finally, we have so many networking opportunities. And that's not just shaking somebody's hand and trying to read their name tag and forgetting their name five minutes later. What we mean by that is we really try to build a community uh, at IHS with our network. And if you've talked to Nigel Ashford, and I hope that you have over the course of this week, you will know that Nigel is our networking master. And uh, if you watch Nigel, you, you'll notice that he does a couple of things. The first is that he will connect people who have uh, similar interests and are working on similar things so that they get to meet each other and potentially start working together. Often they do. Um, but then also connecting people to other opportunities within the Liberty Movement that might be useful. So things uh, like the programs at Mercatus that I've heard him mention several times this week. And that's really what we mean. So one of the things that we, we think is really important at IHS is to build this community. And that means connecting you with other people who care about that, the, the things that you care about, and then also introducing you to other things that you might be interested in and might give you funding or make uh, graduate life easier. So the easiest way to find out about those opportunities is to sign up for the aptly named opportunities email that Nigel sends out once a month. Uh, that is an invaluable resource uh, with just so much information. Um, and then also, you know, uh, keep coming to events like this. If you see something on the website or you see something at in the opportunities email that you're interested in, just shoot us an email and uh, we will let you know what the application process looks like if there are applications and and get you connected with all of those uh, programs. One other thing that I want to mention in terms of networking isn't what we might call that sort of horizontal networking with other um, uh, peers or with outside organizations, but is with faculty directly. So we have a program called uh, mock interviews and dossier reviews that will uh, give you the chance to do a, a mock job interview and will uh, send 
your dossier, your cover letter, your CV, your research statement, all of the stuff that you will eventually use whenever you apply for a job, we will send that stuff to a faculty member in your discipline to get uh, real, direct, very frank feedback so that you can improve that to uh, improve your chances on the market. So we have a whole host of these opportunities and I'm really just scratching the surface here. We could go on for another half hour, but I don't wanna do that because it's almost 8.30. The important thing to take away is this, ITES exists to support you. We are here because we think that what you are doing is what will uh, make the world a freer and more flourishing society. And we are constantly coming up with new ways to uh, help with that mission. So if you see something you're interested in, apply for it. Don't feel like you can apply for too much of our stuff. And if you have a need that doesn't seem to fit into any of the programs that you're uh, seeing on the website or in our emails, just reach out to one of us. And uh, there's a chance that we might have something in a different corner of the organization that can help. Or if not, we'll at least know that there's real interest there. So that's the sort of feedback that really ends up being useful. I just wanna close by saying thank you to the team of staff who have worked this seminar. I've been the one that's in front of the camera, but you would not believe the amount of work that has gone into the back end of making this week happen. Uh, like I mentioned in my opening remarks, we began planning this seminar almost a year ago, and it is such a logistical challenge to get everything ready to go get all the faculty uh, on board, get all of the tech now working. And so uh, when you see all of the IHS staff in the socials tonight, uh, just tell them that you appreciate the work that they've done because uh, they don't have their names plastered anywhere, but they are the unsung heroes of this program and have been the ones who have made it happen. So uh, I would just like to give them a, a virtual round of applause and uh, express my gratitude. And the last gratitude to express is just you. Uh, thanks for showing up. Thanks for sticking with us through this week. And we hope to see you at our next seminar in July and at future IHS programs down the road. Have a good evening.